Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. Today our guest is Michael Kugelman. Michael is Deputy Director and Senior Associate for South Asia with the Wilson Center's Asia Program. And he joins us to discuss uh, some hot goings on in his region of the world, the India-Pakistan confrontation. Uh, confrontation is probably not the right word. How do you characterize it? Well, it was a confrontation, and I would argue that it was almost a war. Uh, you had both Pakistan and when you, India. I'm gonna just, when you say almost, Right. Can what do you, I mean by that? Yeah. How precise is that? I mean, are, at nine out of ten, or a scale of one to ten, how close were we to ten actual warfare? I'd say somewhere between a six and a seven. So maybe that's a bit more reassuring. Yeah. But look, what we had is both India and Pakistan had used force on each other's soil, and that had not happened since 1971 when the two countries fought a pretty brutal war. Uh, but that was before the age of nuclear weapons. So this is the first time that you have each side exchanging force when they both have nuclear weapons. And I think that essentially India struck Pakistan um, and then Pakistan struck India. And at that point, India's next move was key. Luckily, de-escalation happened soon after that. But this is, the, this is the closest that we've been to war for quite a few years. And whenever you add the word nuclear into the equation, the world holds, holds its breath. So when you, when, how did the de-escalation occur? W w who were the cooler heads that prevailed? I mean, it's hard to say. We're still trying to figure out the exact details of this whole crisis. But essentially, um, after Pakistan had launched an airstrike in India, um, the prime minister of uh, Pakistan, Imran Khan, went before the cameras and announced that uh, Pakistan was going to release a pilot that Pakistan had, an Indian pilot that Pakistan had detained the day before. And at that point, um, when Pakistan announced that the pilot was going to be released, that's when the de-escalation started. That's when, you know, pa so ba Pakistan provided the off-ramp. The, the olive branch was the pilot, and yeah, people but took a, a breath? You, it, right, exactly. I mean, not right away. Uh, I mean, after, even when Imran Khan made that speech, it was on a Thursday. The next day, the pilot was released to India. But then that very day, after the Indian pilot was released, the line of control, the contested border between India and Pakistan, became hot again. This is very common. There was exchange of fire uh, across each side of the border. But that did calm down after a point. But the big question is, why did Imran Khan, why did Pakistan decide to release this pilot who had just been captured the day before? He could have been a very useful bargaining chip for Pakistan and so on. My sense is that there was some outside pressures, perhaps from the United States. We're still trying to get a sense as to what's going on. But President Trump was actually in Hanoi um, doing his summit with uh, President Kim from North Korea. And he made, he made a speech, Trump, in which he said, yes, there's been some problems with India and Pakistan, but uh, I think things are going to get better pretty soon. Right, almost a prediction. And Trump is, is known for that, sort of flagging something in advance. Exactly, yeah. The, the, so um, the headline today, uh, uh, before I came in and sat in the studio with you, I wanted to see if there were any breaking news that might change our conversation. And a headline I saw that came in the last 24 hours, U.S. worried as India and Pakistan militaries remain on high alert. So e even though we sort of passed the threshold where the fear of an immediate breakout of war mm -hmm. passed, still high alert is not that reassuring. No, especially when you've got two nuclear-armed rivals. Uh, essentially, this comes down to domestic politics in India. India has an election in just a few weeks, and I think that uh, there's a, a sense that India could decide to try to send another message to Pakistan by perhaps trying to launch a strike into Pakistan, as it did the last time, targeting some type of terrorist facility. Uh, you know, in, in India, as you can imagine, being tough on Pakistan, taking a hard line on Pakistan, it plays well politically, particularly during campaign season. The government in India uh, came under some fire during the recent crisis, and specifically in terms of not being str clear enough as to what exactly happened when it launched its strike in Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan claimed that nothing was really hit, no terrorists were killed, uh, and satellite imagery has actually borne that out. So India sort of came out of this looking a bit confused and not very clear. So India could therefore decide to try to do one more thing, um, send a message to Wag the dog uh, approach. Exactly. So is, the, is uh, the campaign rhetoric, is it focused on anti-Pakistani rhetoric in the Indian elections? It is, and particularly given that we've had this crisis, which I should say um, goes back to a, uh, an attack, a terrorist attack in India-administered Kashmir on Valentine's Day. It was carried out by a terror group that is uh, based in Pakistan and has ties to the Pakistani state. So once that happened, that's when the anti-Pakistan sentiment, even before the airstrikes happened, 
the, uh, the anti-Pakistan sentiment was heard very vociferously on the campaign trail, and it continues to be. I mean, in India, like many other countries, um, foreign policy is generally not the dominant factor or the dominant theme on the campaign trail. You know, unemployment had been going up in India uh, in recent months. That had put the ruling party on the defensive, so that had been a big focus. But I think that's really been sidelined now because mm. of the whole Pakistan issue. Yeah, it's not the dominant issue until it is, right, right exactly. at a moment like this. And you mentioned Kashmir. Could you explain the complexities of the governance in the region? Yeah, well, it's too complex, it's too complex well, to, to, to do, explain. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, generally speaking, Kashmir is a region that's, that's disputed, um, and it's claimed by both India and Pakistan. Half of Kashmir is administered by India. Half of it is administered by Pakistan. Again, both countries claim it, the region in its entirety goes back to the independence wars, uh, war, independence war fought by India and Pakistan in 1947 when they both became free and the status of Kashmir from the start was, was fraught and fought over, literally. Uh, and you had millions of people die in an in independence war. Um, and yet after that, and even after several more wars between India and Pakistan over Kashmir, the, the status continues to be disputed. But as complicated as it is, it's generally worked for almost, what, 50 years now. As you said, it was the 70s. Right. Uh, it was the last break out of hostilities. Uh, is it working? Yeah, I mean, you could argue the two sides have muddled along, uh, that it could have been a lot worse. Uh, certainly, Pakistan would not claim it's working um, because, you know, it's really India-administered Kashmir where most of the problems have been. This is an area that you know, India controls, it administers. But it, it, it exerts that control and administration through um, frequently heavy-handed uses of force by its security forces who are planted in India-administered Kashmir. It's led to all kinds of violence, and many innocent Kashmiris have been killed. Uh, this is something that's really galvanized Pakistani public opinion and the government. And there are, the Pakistan's argument is that we need to do something about this. We need to open up the, the region to, uh, to dialogue again and try to figure out what should really happen here. Uh, India, of course, is said that Pakistan has been responsible for a lot of the unrest and the terrorism in Kashmir by providing support to non-state actors that have staged attacks, uh, including the one on February 14th in Kashmir, in an effort to undercut India's control over this region that Pakistan claims and wants. Uh, ab about that, it's not just India who makes that claim. The United States continues to complain that Pakistan isn't doing enough about right. terrorism. Uh, talk about that a bit. Is that a legitimate charge? Does Pakistan need to up its game? It is a legitimate charge. I mean, it's complicated because Pakistan does target very uh, uh, heartily uh, particular types of terrorists, especially those that stage attacks in Pakistan. I mean, it's, I guess it's only natural. You go after those that threaten you the most. However, there are other terrorist groups in Pakistan that um, don't stage attacks in Pakistan. They stage attacks in India and in Afghanistan. These are the groups that Pakistan has not dealt with. They continue to have a presence. They have safe havens. They get other types of support from the Pakistani state. Why is that? Because Pakistan considers them to be useful. It mm -hmm. allows these assets to push back against countries that Pakistan is unhappy about, like, like India and Afghanistan. Um, it's almost a form of foreign policy, as you describe it. Yeah, exactly. I, I also describe it as sort of an asymmetric uh, asset, these, these, these terror groups, just because Pakistan's army is nowhere near as powerful as India. So it could never compete with India in a big conventional war. So it uses these asymmetric assets, these, these militant groups, as a way to push back against India. That also, that equation you just described also ups the ante on the, the, the nuclear fears, because if you can't fight a conventional war, that becomes your deterrent. Yeah, exactly. And this is, an, this is really, you could say this is another asymmetric asset of Pakistan is nuclear weapons. And it's never embraced a no first use policy, which means theoretically, any time India launches military force in Pakistan, including what happened in recent weeks, Pakistan theoretically could respond with a nuclear uh, act. I, I saw a, a quote from the new Secretary General Vladimir Norov of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization saying that uh, the issues between India and Pakistan should be resolved bilaterally and their participation in that security grouping could become impossible without a commitment of an un unconditional approach to, to uh, terrorism and separatist mm -hmm. movements. Is that organization, the, uh, the SCO, is, is that a, a good forum for improving relations between these two nations who now are joint members of right. I mean, there are a number of regional and global organizations where both India and Pakistan are members, but the problem with the SCO is that it tends to be dominated by China and Russia. Um, so, you know, both India and Pakistan are generally bit players here, mm -hmm. so I don't see it, unfortunately, as the forum where they could try to make things work. Um, is there a forum that could be really useful? 
I mean, there is a South Asia regional organization, the South Asian Association of Regional uh, Cooperation, but it's notorious for being incredibly inefficient for the very reason that India and Pakistan refuse to cooperate. I mean, decisions, policies are made through unanimity, and, you know, India and Pakistan are always going to disagree, and there's been no indication that that regional forum has been helpful or could be helpful in getting the two sides to work out their issues. Um, but clearly you need something like that because the bilateral path is not sufficient. I think that's very clear. When you, when you look ahead, Michael, beyond the current s situation uh, and, and you look at the trend lines, you see things like this strained agreement over, over water resources in the Indus River and, and mm -hmm. some other areas for a potential further disagreement. W what, do, what do you see in those trend lines? Do you see a scenario where we could see improving relations between the two countries or can this continue to right. percolate as a potential disaster? And so it's, it's going to fester for quite some time. And I think it, w we'll have to see what happens in India's election. That's key. India's got an election in April, and the, it'll, this being India, the election will take four weeks. Uh, and so the results will be announced in mid-May. So the largest election on planet Earth as far is. as the number of votes. By far, yes. yeah. Uh, so once there's a new government in place there, we'll have a better sense as to where things will go. We'll have a sense as to whether that new government would be any more interested in the previous one in engaging with Pakistan again. If, if the ruling party is reelected, which I actually think is quite likely, I don't think, I think things will just get worse. Um, the bottom line is that the, t the two sides show that they were willing to um, engage in military force uh, all under the nuclear umbrella, which again had not happened since 1971 before there was a nuclear umbrella, before there were nuclear weapons. So that suggests to me that you know, the tensions will continue. There will be another Pakistan-India crisis, and that next one could be worse, just because each side has indicated that it's perfectly happy to climb up the escalation ladder. Yeah, that, that point you make about willing to engage militarily, <clears throat> even with nuclear weapons now in the equation, that's certainly unnerving. That's very unnerving, because you know the higher the higher you go up that escalation ladder, the greater the chance, even if still remote, for some type of nuclear exchange. And that's where you know miscalculations become more magnified, because if there's one wrong move or something like that, who knows? Well, I hate to end on such an ominous note, <laughs> but then again, we're not in the prediction business here; you're in the analysis business. So <laughs> thanks for sharing your analysis today. Terrific stuff. Thank you. Always. Always a pleasure. Hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now and that you'll join us again for another edition in the future. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us.